The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Rated by Independent Research, the most popular West Coast program in radio history. In gasoline, you know, it takes extra quality to give you extra mileage. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the Signal circle sign in yellow and black that identifies friendly dealer-owned Signal service stations from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story. Windfall. The man stood at the railing of the Jefferson Bridge, looking over the rail, hesitant, undecided. In a way, it was a foolish move, but on the other hand, he didn't know. He finally made up his mind, put his foot on the rail, and then stopped suddenly at the sound of steps. Oh. Uh, good evening, officer. What's the matter, buddy? Uh, nothing. I was just uh, looking at the view. Hmm. Thought you might be planning something foolish. <laughs> What if I give you that idea? Well, it's been done before, not far from this spot. Ah, I'd better be getting on. So long. So long. A half minute later, he made up his mind. Disappeared over the side. It was a good gamble. The hat he'd seen on the ground near the bridge timbers was nearly new. He smiled to himself started to try it on, and then saw something that stopped him in his tracks, frozen. Not six feet away was the battered body of a man, sprawled on the ground near one of the bridge stanchions. He paused for a minute, thinking, and then moved quickly to the body and searched the pockets. He wasn't lucky this time. There was no money, no identification, not even a pocket handkerchief. And then as he fumbled for a name tag inside the hat, he discovered something else. Stuck under the sweatband was a slim, black-covered checkbook. He just had time to stuff it in his pocket when the sound of steps on the bridge above told him the strolling officer had returned. There was only one thing to do now, call the officer, and he did it. After a brief examination... Can't figure it out. Not a mark of identification on him. Nothing in his pockets. <laughs> you didn't touch him, did you? Oh, I know better than that. Yeah? Yeah, I climbed down here after that hat there. I see. Is it, uh, suicide? Not in my book. He didn't get battered up this bad jumping off any bridge. Huh. Uh, we can't do anything for him now. I guess that's, uh, up to the next of kin. If we ever find out who the guy is. A lot of them end up with a blank tag on their big toe, you know. Well, I better call in. You stick around, buddy. They may want to ask you some questions. And that's how it began, Ted, with a dead man and a checkbook. Later, when you're alone, you examine it closely. Find it's a standard one in a local bank with seven stubs showing large withdrawals. And your heart almost stops. It's a windfall, Ted. The stub shows a balance of over $104,000. Your head begins to spin. It's staggering, isn't it, Ted? You wonder what'll happen if the dead man goes unidentified. The strange man who carried his checkbook in the sweatband of his hat. Who bothered to keep check stubs with a bank balance of more than $100,000. If you can learn who he is, learn how to forge his signature. You try to stop thinking about it. Try to force it from your mind. But it keeps coming back again and again. 
Even while you answer more questions during the inquest at the coroner's office, that figure, $104,000, keeps lighting up in your brain over and over again like a neon sign. If the man's unidentified, Ted, if you can find a copy of his signature, $104,000. You, sir. Hmm? Oh, yes, Mr. Coroner. The inquest is over. You can go now. Your name is... Ted Lacarno. Ted Lacarno. Okay. Police know how to get in touch with you. We'll call you again if we need you. Nothing more we can do now. Uh, you mean you've uh, found who he is? No. Nope. Worse yet, there's no way to trace him. Of course, these things take time, you know. Sometimes a few days, sometimes a week or a month before somebody misses a man and checks with us. Then, uh, uh, what, uh, what's the verdict? Eh, the usual, victim unidentified, death at hands of person or persons unknown. Tough, huh? Yeah, tough. With the prologue of Windfall, the Signal Oil Company is bringing you another strange story by The Whistler. But now, since this spring marks the 25th anniversary of Signal Oil, it's interesting to look back on a formula for serving you better that Signal has followed ever since the very beginning. First of all, Signal products have always been sold only through dealer-owned stations. The reason? Signal believes that a man with his own money invested in his own business has extra incentive to give your car more conscientious, more thorough service that spells long, trouble-free miles. Secondly, because you want top quality products for your car, each individual signal service station is backed by a young progressive organization, now serving almost 2,000 signal dealers with resources to bring you every latest advance in petroleum science. Obviously, drivers like this combination of personal service at dealer-owned signal stations plus fine quality signal products. For signal has grown and grown year after year, from a mere handful of stations serving Southern California to an organization now serving six western states from Canada to Mexico. If you haven't discovered how much extra pleasure this signal formula can add to driving, stop by your neighborhood signal station soon. See for yourself why every day more and more drivers are joining the switch to signal. And now, back to the whistler. Yes, Ted, it began with the dead man you found under the Jefferson Bridge with a checkbook in his hatband. A man lying now on a slab in the morgue, unidentified. It's a windfall, Ted, if you can find out who he is and get a copy of his signature. You sit alone in your hotel room after the inquest, going over the stubs in the book. There are seven of them. Payments to a jewelry firm, a dress shop, several to cash. But the one that interests you is the bottom one, $350, to the Briarcliff Apartments. Next morning, freshly shaven, wearing a clean shirt, your suit carefully pressed, you enter the Briarcliff Apartments. The manager is a little startled when you tell him you're an OPA investigator and want to go over his record. It doesn't take long to discover a $350 apartment. There's only one. I'm sorry, I don't have things quite up to date, Mr. Anderson. Don't worry about it. Uh, everything seems to be in order. Uh, this uh, schedule covers the whole building? Yes, that's right. Uh, our apartments run 220 and 280, except this one, of course. Uh, $350. Uh, what does this cover? Here, the penthouse. Oh, I see. Uh, who lives there? A uh, Miss Harriet Stark. Uh-huh. Oh, apparently you haven't received a payment from her this month. Oh, I'm afraid not. She's a little behind this month. Oh, well, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, thank you uh, very much. I'd better be getting along now. How do you do? Miss Stark? That's right. My name is Anderson, OPA. Mind if I come in? Not at all. 
I'll come right to the point, Miss Stark. We have reason to believe the rents in this building are over schedule. I understand that you're paying $350. That's right. Uh, do you have any evidence of those payments, canceled checks and so on? I think so. Sit down, won't you? Uh, no, thank you. I'd better not. I can only stay a minute. I just happen to have this check for the current month's rent. I intended to drop it off at the manager's office. Here you are. Uh, oh, Edward Reese. Uh, I see. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll take it along. It'll be returned to you, of course. Wait a minute. I... Yes? Don't go. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm in a hurry, and I... Well, I wouldn't be in too big a hurry if I were you. No? No. You see, I want you to tell me why you really came here. I happen to know that 350 is official schedule for this apartment because I've checked it myself. Now, do you want to let your hair down, or shall I call the OPA office? You're doing pretty well. Why don't you go on? You're a blackmailer, aren't you? You're the man Edward was afraid of. Edward Race? Who else? He was afraid of a blackmailer, huh? Why? Suppose you tell me. I don't know the answer to that one, but he had a good reason to be afraid. You see, Edward Reese is dead. Dead? Yes, I found his body night before last under the Jefferson Bridge. It's down at the morgue now, unidentified. Well, I guess it's up to me to call them. Oh, wait a minute. Don't do anything rash. What do you mean? I, uh, I had a good reason for coming here, Miss Stark. Did you? You uh, seem to have done pretty well up to now. Uh, where do you go from here? I don't see what that has to do with you. You didn't answer the question. What happens now that Reese is dead? Do you, uh, check out, forget it, or do you take a look to see if there are any more... Uh, golden eggs around. Look, mister. Lacarno. Ted Lacarno. Before you go any further, take a look at this. Edward Reese's checkbook. I found it in his hat under the bridge. There's a balance of $104,000 in the account. And nobody knows that he's dead. Uh, does that uh, suggest anything to you? I don't know. I... We couldn't get away with anything like this. <laughs> Thanks, baby. You just passed the exam. Only one thing bothers you, doesn't it? Can we get away with it? I... I don't know. Answer that one, will you? Can we get away with it? That's all that matters to you now, isn't it? Yes. That's all that matters. Good. Ah, let me see that check again. Edward Reese. <laughs> Standard Spencerian. Probably picked it up in the fifth grade and never changed it. I'll have that signature down cold in 24 hours. You're pretty sure of yourself. All I need is a little practice. Sure. But how about that body in the morgue? What if someone identifies it? So it's a gamble. I don't know about you, but with a payoff like that, I'll take a flyer. We hold off a few days. If no one tags him, we go move in. It's as simple as that. Is it? Now, what's bothering you? Oh, I'm just wondering. I, I know. You're wondering what's to prevent you from learning to forge that signature and draw checks on the account yourself. Maybe. Well, there's only one thing. That's me. This is a two-way deal, baby. Let's have that understood right now. Okay? Okay. Yes, Ted, you need each other. But this plenty to share, $104,000. You spend all that night practicing the signature. Over and over, you write the name Edward Reese. Ten times, a hundred, a thousand. By morning, you can sign the name as if it were your own. And with a little luck, it might as well be. You leave your room and buy a newspaper. Scan it hungrily as you gulp your coffee. On page six, in the lower right column, you find an obscure item that almost knocks you over. You can't wait to get to Harriet. Let her read it, too. The battered body found beneath the Jefferson Bridge was identified last night by Mrs. Rosa Montalvo. Oh. Read on, read on. Uh, Rosa Montalvo, uh, who told police it was that of her husband, Jerry. Ted, they think Reese is Montalvo. Yeah, that makes everything perfect. It's clear sailing now, and we can take our time. Edward won't be missed for weeks, Ted. He never let people know when he came to the city. Yeah, there's one thing, his bank statements. Is there anyone they go no, to? No, no, it's a separate account. The statements are sent to a post office box. I have the key. Ah. 
Mister, all you have to do now is start writing checks. The desk's right over there. Oh, wait a minute. It's not that easy. We're not breaking into a piggy bank. I thought you said yourself they think he's alive. Oh, look, sweetheart, you don't just walk into a bank and try to cash a check for 10,000 bucks. The teller would jump out of his cage. But... It's a business of transferring credit from one account to another. We got to work for this, baby. Set up phony corporations, letterheads, statements, invoices, right down the line. You seem to know your business. They call me the bright boy who never got a break. (laughs) I, uh, got one now. (laughs) Well, what's our next move? Well, we'll need some cash to get things started. How much you got on hand? Not much. The check stubs say different. I live well. It goes fast. Oh. How much is not much? About $85. Yeah, you do live well. All right, we'll have to take a chance. You think the bank would hold still if you tried to cash one of Reese's checks for a grand? I don't know. I've never... Well, you'll know tomorrow. It's a gamble, but we got to try... Uh, meanwhile, I can use about 20 of that 85 bucks of yours. Uh, how about it? Okay. Until tomorrow. Uh, even thousand, eh? That's right. Excuse me a moment, Miss Stark. I'll have to speak to the cashier. Yes, Austin? Uh, Miss Stark over there. She wants to cash this, sir. Miss Stark? Oh, yes. <laughs> well, Reese's account is good for him. Then it's uh, all right? I think so. Here, I'll initial it. Thank you, sir. I see what you mean about cashing checks. I thought I'd die in there. You did beautifully, Angel. And it's the last time you'll have to worry about it. We'll be in business within a week. See, it's like I told you last week, baby. We're in business. It wasn't easy. Establishing identity in a bank is a neat trick, but I made it. Ted, you're wonderful. Yeah, three dummy corporations. All of them are you and me. <laughs> E.C., look at this. E.C. Layton Jewelry Company, $700. Malcolm Dittmar Furrier, $1,250. Atkins Brothers, $920. <laughs> Not bad, huh? I wish I was actually getting some of those things. Oh, honey, once we got all that dough spread around on these accounts, we can get it out and skip before anybody here begins to wonder about Edward Reese. Well, it can't be soon enough for me. Oh, now, don't get anxious, sweetheart. We're doing great. In another week, we'll really begin to cash in. That... You expecting anybody? Relax, I'll get rid of them. Yes? Excuse me, ma'am, but I'm from the Mary Ann Flower Shop. Oh, yes, the flower. We hate to trouble you, but there's a considerable balance that hasn't been taken care of, and Mary Ann thought that you'd want it called well, your attention. Well, of course. To... How much is it? It's $69. Just a minute. Oh, Edward? Yeah. Write the gentleman a check, will you, darling? Oh, uh, can't they send a bill? Please, darling. I forgot to give it to you, and they've been very patient as it is. It's only $69. Pretty, please. Uh, okay, <laughs> sweetheart, save that talk for something expensive. Uh, go get my pen. Yes, hmm? dear. Uh, they, uh, they think it grows on trees. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, I suppose it does for some people, sir. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I suppose it does. Yes, Ted, it does grow on trees, at least for you and Harry. Everything's going smoothly so far, perfect. You're able to relax, to feel more sure of yourself. It's almost as if you are Edward Reese, not only because of the money, but a growing interest in Harriet. She's an exciting girl, isn't she, Ted? Very exciting. Perhaps that's why you're thinking so much about your appearance lately, why you walk into a clothing store near the end of the week and get fitted for a new suit. The clerk is gone for some time after you make your purchase. You're standing in front of the mirror when he comes back, embarrassed and apologetic. Uh, Mr. McConnell, I'm terribly sorry, but the check this Mr. Reese gave you, it's... Oh, uh, uh, what's the matter with it? Well, just as a matter of routine, of course, we called the bank, and I'm afraid your friend hasn't sufficient funds to cover it. What? I hope it's only a mistake, sir, that you know him well enough. Oh, yes, yes, I know him well enough. 
And I'd better go and see him right away. What did you do with it, Harriet? Where's the money? I tell you, I don't know anything about it. Over 80000 left in that account, and they couldn't cover a check for two hundred. That wasn't smart, baby, not at all. I don't know what you're talking about. No? Now, why the suitcase? When people start packing, they're going somewhere. Well, I was nervous about staying here, Ted. This apartment makes me nervous. You couldn't wait. You got anxious. No, you Ted. You never stopped figuring it from the first day I walked in here. You could practice that signature, too. Ted, please, it's I'm... It's no go, baby. I won't be played for a sucker. It's more than the money. Ted. You had me hooked all the way. But that's over. And so are you, sweetheart. No. So are you. Ted, no! You stand there for a moment looking down at her like a man in a nightmare. The red rage in your mind slowly subsiding, leaving you free to think. And you have to think fast, Ted. You got that money somehow. You're sure of it. It's here in the apartment somewhere. You go through the half-packed suitcase first, and then tear a room apart, searching frantically. You've almost combed the apartment when... The door. Someone's at the door. You walk quickly through the kitchen to the trade entrance, let yourself out cautiously, glance down the corridor to the front door. The little man from Mary Ann's flower shop is standing there patiently. You slip around the corner, down the fire stairs, and out of the building. Twenty minutes later, you're entering the dingy lobby of your hotel. The man at the desk looks up nervously. And a moment later, you know why. When a plain clothesman moves up quickly. Ted Lacano? Yes? I want to talk to you down at headquarters. Well, what's the matter? I haven't... Just routine. Some questions about that guy you found under the bridge. They've arrested a suspect. Oh, Oh, well, look, do they have to talk to me? I've got an appointment. It won't take long, buddy. But I've told them all I know. They want to hear it again. Okay, but let's make it quick, huh? I got a car right outside. The whole thing shouldn't take more than an hour. You're still all right, Ted. That is, if you can talk to the police quickly, answer their questions and be on your way. As you ride across town in the police car, you hope that the little man from the flower shop didn't get into Harriet's apartment or raise any kind of fuss. At headquarters, the lieutenant in charge is almost apologetic. You run through the story, telling it exactly the way you did the first time. The lieutenant seems satisfied. You didn't move the body or touch anything, Locarno. Not a thing. I know better than that. Just called the officer on the beat, is that it? Right. Uh, that seems to cover it all. You see, we didn't have much to go on in this case. Yes, Sergeant? We still haven't been able to talk to the Stark dame. We've called, and Conway's been over to her apartment twice. She's not at home. We've got to talk to her, Sergeant. Break into the apartment if you have to. Bring her in. Okay. Well, I, uh, I guess I can be running along, huh, Lieutenant? Uh, just one more thing, Locarno. There's a stenographer in the next room here. Would you mind repeating the story to her? <laughs> The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Right now, however, I'd like to say a word about the current trend back to good old-fashioned value in buying. Frankly, we at Signal are delighted to see this. After all, Signal gasoline, the famous go-farther gasoline, has long been the choice of drivers who appreciate extra value. And for two good reasons. One, of course, is Signal's good mileage. And number two is the thing which makes that good mileage possible. Signal superior performance. Here's what I mean. In order to put that thrilling knock-free power back of your accelerator, Signal gasoline has to help your motor run more efficiently. And when your motor runs more efficiently, naturally you enjoy extra mileage. So you see, mileage is the result of the same features a gasoline must have to give you superior performance. That's why Signal says, in gasoline, it takes extra quality to go farther. And remember, Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. And now, back to the whistler. So you have to fight it through for another five minutes, Ted. 
And a police station is the last place in the world you'd choose right now. With a picture of Harriet lying dead in her apartment still fresh in your mind. It's too bad, isn't it, Ted? Everything would have been so different if she hadn't insisted on taking it all. The untapped balance in Edward Reese's fabulous checkbook would have bought the world for both of you. But you have to forget that now. Concentrate on the matter at hand. Tell your story and get out of the police station before the lieutenant's men break into the apartment. Before anything develops that will link you to the murder of Harriet Stark. You follow the lieutenant to the door of the stenographer's office. Only take you a minute, Placarno. Mary Ann Oh, Flower wait, Shop. Lieutenant. Mary Ann Flower Shop. That's right. When I read all about Miss Reese in the papers, I went right up to Miss Stark's apartment. Nobody answered. So I thought I'd come down here and take it up directly with Mr. Reese. Well, I'm sorry. You can't see Mr. Oh, she's now. busy, Lieutenant. I'll, uh, I'll come back. This guy isn't important. Uh, no, no, later. Look, I tell you it's all right. That guy isn't a witness. He's just been pestering us to let him talk to Edward Reese. Reese? Yeah, he's the suspect I told you about. Knocked off that guy you found under the bridge. You've, uh, arrested him? You've got Reese here? In the tank. And we've got all we need to hang him. But I... You haven't heard the last of me, young lady. I'll get to Mr. Reese. Might seem small to you people, but when a $69 check bounces, it means a great deal to Mary Ann Flores. And believe me... Uh... Why, Mr. Reese, hello. I've been begging them to let me see you. Huh? Did... Did I say something wrong? Why are you looking at Mr. Reese? The man's made a mistake, Lieutenant. You know my name is Locarno. You were there. That night in the apartment. Here. I have the check you signed. Edward Reese. Let's see that check. Of course. He signed this? Now, wait a minute. I... How long has this been going on, Locarno? I tell you, I don't know anything about it. No. Now, just a minute, Lieutenant. I'm not going to stand here and have someone tell me I'm lying. He was in Miss Stark's apartment that night. He wrote this check. He did, huh? Well, what's wrong, Locarno? You look a little pale. Ever take a crack at forgery before, Locarno? You know, I'd have given you credit for more sense. How did you figure to get away with it? Reese would get wise the minute he saw his bank statement. Reese is dead. He's the guy I found under the bridge. Uh, don't you read the papers. The guy's name was Montalvo. His wife identified him. She made a mistake. We checked it. It's Montalvo right down to his bridge work. He'd been blackmailing Reese for months. Wait a minute. You mean Sure. He... Reese got fed up with blackmail and killed Montalvo. We picked Reese up last night after he cleaned out his bank account and tried to get out of the country. The bank account? Then that's what happened to it. He was a clumsy operator, too, Locarno. Huh? Yeah. Reese made as big a mistake as you did. He left his hat at the scene of the crime. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Monday at 8. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil and fine quality automotive accessories. Signal has asked me to remind you, to get the most driving pleasure, drive at sensible speeds, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own. <laughs> Featured in tonight's story were Frank Lovejoy and Francis Cheney. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen with music by Wilbur Hatch, story by Joel Malone and Harold Swanton, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>